I would just like to welcome you to Polk County. And on behalf of the Florida A&M uh, National Alumni Association, as well as Polk County Chapter, our president is Ms. Doris Hicks. And I am on the executive board. I'm Betty Woodard. And since you have on that, I'm just going to pass that to you because you can't stick anything in and a little token Thank gift you. here. And don't lose that I will. money. Oh, okay. I will not be losing that. <laughs> Understood. Thank you oh, so thank much. You. <laughs> mm. Appreciate her. it. Did you get it? <laughs> I will. It gives me great pleasure to introduce our guest moderator for the evening. Mitzi Miller is known as a best-selling author and award-winning journalist who became editor-in-chief of Ebony Magazine in April 2014. Prior to that, Ms. Miller was editor-in-chief of Jet Magazine, a position she held since May of 2011. Within two short years, her vision of revamp revamping the iconic 62-year-old brand was realized with its first and only successful cover-to-cover -cover redesign, new website launch, and improved social media presence. After majoring in English at Florida, at the Florida A&M University, <laughs> Miller began her career at awesome. Honey Magazine, where she grew from an intern to entertainment editor. She later became associate relationship editor at Jane Magazine and the editor-in-chief at Set Magazine. The New York native has co-authored five popular books over the past decade. The Vow, a novel, The Angry Black Woman's Guide to Life, and the Three Little Hot Lanta Young Adult Series. For her pro professionalism and passion, Miller's recent accolades include recognition among the Root 100 honorees for 2013 and 2014 Florida A&M University's 125 outstanding alumni. She is currently on the board of directors for Jack and Jill of America Foundation, and she resides in Chicago, Illinois. Welcome, Ms. Midler. Miller. Awesome. Awesome. I want to call you Bet Miller. <laughs> Thank you. I really appreciate it. Any and every opportunity to get out of the cold. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so um, I'm really excited about this conversation tonight. Brown, black, and blue. This is something that's kind of a topic that's been talked about all year for the past year was in the headlines across the nation. So I'm hoping that we get a lot of good thoughts and ideas <clears throat> tossed around and how to make things better for everybody because this isn't just you know a small Polk County issue this sure. is a big across the board issue and as the elections come up people need to be talking so I'll start with um, the first question under the topic of community and I guess you can just sort of raise your hand that's how I'll know if you have an answer or something that you want to add to this question We've learned, for those who had the pleasure of viewing it, we learned from the movie Selma that it took, takes all races to working together to, to achieve progress in the civil rights movement. What are some ways that those here tonight can work together to continue the movement in Polk County? Anyone want to start at the end? Raising awareness and then right. taking that awareness and going out in the community and actualizing it, politicizing and socializing it making it work in different communities, through different um, agendas and objectives and organizations as well. Is my mic not working? Yep, yeah. I can hear you. It's working. Yeah. <laughs> so um, I would just like to congratulate us all coming out already. Right. Because we're starting the process by talking. Right. I'm with this gentleman, and I'm excited to be here. I'm honored that Melissa asked me to be here. And I really want to start the conversation. Uh, as being from Polk County, mm -hmm. uh, race in a small town, uh, being a female, and I think I'm the only female on this panel. <laughs> right, <laughs> gotta represent. Uh, it gotta represent, and, it's, it, and to me, it's not been about uh, the color of my skin or the, or the um, female, male, you know, it's breaking through those barriers. Uh, 
working together as a community. And, and I'm just very fortunate to be able to say that I'm from a small community. And can I say that, um, you know, do we have diverse on every board? Uh, no, that's not happening. Okay. But, but eventually it will happen. All right. And great. Here. One of the things that I think each and every one of us here have had an opportunity to persevere through certain obstacles. And so finding what those issues are or those opportunities and making the best of those opportunities allows for you to attain those, the higher level of education. Education is the great equalizer. Education breaks down <coughs> barriers. Education allows for us all to be here in the room and having this conversation. But it doesn't just start here in, in the world, in the halls of academia. It starts at home. So certainly what we can do to get parents involved in their childhood education early and the value of community engagement, civic involvement is so critically important. I can just tell you from a city manager's perspective, when you look at 1,500 people out of 10,000 registered voters determine who serves on an elected seat, it's deplorable. So many people have given so much and have lost so much for the right to vote, and we do not participate in our communities to determine the trajectory of our communities, both now and in the future. So I, I think inciting the young folks, exciting the community about that your vote matters, your voice counts, but getting out there and going to a commission meeting, finding out what's going on in your community. Civic participation is going to allow for every young person, every race, religion, creed, sexual disposition, genetic disposition to be heard. You just have to be willing to get involved and put some sweat equity in. Right. Thank you, Jonathan. And I think that that is a perfect segue into my next question. What can the individuals do in their everyday lives to improve race relations in addition to being more proactive about education and getting involved. Does anyone else have anything? We can get involved in our school system. Let me give you, in the last seven months, the last seven months we have had 1,500 African American men and women in our schools to mentor our children or to talk to them. In contrast, we've had 18,000 white men and women who came into our schools. Now let me tell you something right now. From day one, when I first started in 1980, we need men, African American men and women, to be in our schools so that these young people can see the attorneys, the lawyers, the plumbers, the electricians, all of these men and women who are out there working every day, who are fathers and mothers, that's who should be in our schools, mentoring our children, telling them about what they do. The first question, working together is what stood out to me. Working together. And I'm a firm believer that in order to work together, a relationship has to be formed. And, you know, looking at, looking at things from a, looking at this, these questions, the two questions, and basically dissecting them to a point that where in order to form, form a relationship you have to identify the barriers you know that are there and there are social economic barriers that are in place and then those barriers has to be removed and I think that one of the way you remove them is that you encourage the education on getting our young black men, young black women, involved in community events, please. So I'm going to go off script and just throw this question out to everyone on the panel. Is the education only needed for those in the African American community, or is there some education needed in all of the communities? Like, we need to educate other communities about what's happening with African Americans so that they can be more sensitive. Um, police Chief? As far as law enforcement? Mm -hmm. uh, because that's been a topic the last few months with race. Right. The main thing is before we try to tackle mm. the race in law enforcement issues is we need to build relationships. Okay. You know, uh, I don't want to talk to you about crime or you know what's going on in your neighborhood. I want me and you to talk about how the day is. You know, right. just 
non-pressured conversations to where you know, we can start that foundation of a relationship and build trust. The, the issues, the tougher issues that will come up like, you know, what are you going to do about crime in my neighborhood or, or something like that, that comes later once mm -hmm. the, the foundation and the trust is built. So, so we have to go from here mm -hmm. and not just leave it at here, but continue. Uh, so, tomorrow, somebody come up and talk to me and just say, you know, how are you doing today? Have African Americans <laughs> and the African American community stereotype themselves by being, seeming like they're only passionate and vocal when it's around race relations and race issues as opposed to say education or wealth or wellness issues. Do you feel like they're, they've kind of boxed themselves in? I think like it's, it's the perception that we get excited when it comes to race issues, but mm -hmm. in terms of um, education, things, we kind of silent on that. I think as uh, minorities, black, Spanish, whatever, we got to go further than just um, jumping on race issues. There's issues in terms of job, employment, mm -hmm. uh, family issues, raising your family right. So we need to expand our, uh, uh, our conversation. But I think that's where mutual education on both sides of the issue come. Um, I do not believe that African Americans have stereotyped themselves. I was taught a long time ago that you talk about what hurts you. Right. And you talk about what has affected you. And many individuals feel as if, if we can solve that issue first, then we can move on to the other issues. I tend to believe that we need to work on these things simultaneously. I agree. I, don't, I can't say that the, the African Americans are, are stereotyped themselves. I think that when you talk about passion, I think you can talk about people who are passionate about their football team. So right. I, I don't believe that they become passionate themselves. Um, you know, I, I've been fortunate to be elected as an elected official here in the city of Winter Haven. I think that, you know, I had to define what my role was going to be. And when you talk about community, I think, and I go out into the public, it, it comes down to common unity. Mm -hmm. I think everybody wants to be a part of everything that's out there. And, and I think that we have to define our roles as individuals up here on this panel and what it is that we are going to achieve. Obviously, this conversation is, is a big part of what's going on. And also being able to reach out to the people here and, and let them know from early age, like I've done my kids all the way up to my grandkids, is that when you're born, you're an asset, not a liability. Right. And, and they really have to understand that. And, and how do we reach out? I think the, the common ground here is the importance of education in the community. But one of the things that I think we need to do a better job in the education system, I think what the president's comments were with respect to community college is important, but also why do we allow 16-year-olds to be able to make a decision to drop out of school? Right. Why don't we say, if you are not going to, if you are going to drop out of school, let's get you into a diversionary program where you can become a plumber, electrician, some other skill or some other trade. Thank you. Because if, if, I, if I was to take, and, I, and I've done this with many kids, if I draw a picture of a plumber, a banker, and a teacher, invariably they always think the banker makes more than the plumber. A good plumber can make more than a good city manager. And what we're going to do is I'm going to mix up the, the format a little bit so that I'm not the only one asking the questions. If you guys can have questions, you can raise your hand as we go along so that you can react to what they're saying immediately as opposed to waiting until the end. Okay? I'm going to change that up just so it'll go a little faster and people won't forget what they were thinking. Um, I think that's great. And since we are circling back on education, I'm going to ask about STEM. For the educators on the panel, what are we doing to encourage students, minorities, to get into the STEM fields because that is an area that we're severely lacking in. There's a lot of money in that, but you know you have to start when they're young. So I'm curious to hear. Here? Um, something that they're doing to um, increase minorities' participation in STEM is also adding the A to it, the arts, which makes it STEAM. So you have a lot of um, individuals from the African American community that are highly into the arts. So that's one way to attract them. But also with the um, different STEM programs, you have where it's a lot of hands-on activities where they're doing robotics and all types of right. stuff where they're learning and doing more than they would do in a normal classroom and don't mind doing it because it's an actual hand-on opportunity. Anyone else have something yeah, to add um, specifically about the science and technology? I'm presently working at Jewett Middle Academy here in Winter Haven, which is a magnet uh, science technology um, program or school. Um, also, to your mic. Oh, recently, um, the district just um, received about $11 million to enhance their STEM programs. Matter of fact, they put it in about four different schools around the county, and primarily uh, what we call ur urban rural areas. Uh, Dundee Ridge Middle School, which I spent a number of years 
of my, of my experience here in Polk County, they just became a STEM school because the minority population was the majority population within that school. Um, and then with rezoning and things of that nature, now a lot of our young African Americans especially are being encouraged to take the higher level classes, the classes that actually help them to think outside of the box. Who, raise your hand if this is the first time that you're hearing about these programs and these opportunities. Okay. Is this the first time you're hearing about it too or you want to, okay. <laughs> we have in the Polk County system over 35 academies. I think a lot of you know about that. But for example, Tenor Rock has a uh, working relationship with Lakeland Electric. And they come out and they teach all about what uh, Lakeland Electric does, alignment and all the rest. And as you said, some of those jobs pay a lot more than a city manager right. or a banker. Of course, this, this is a, oh, I have a question here, I'm sorry. Just speak up. Right, you just speak up a little bit, we can How hear. do you get transportation from Winter Haven to the Lakeland School or Lake Wales to the Okay, schools? so it sounds like, trans like yeah, it sounds like there's a transport question about the transportation for people outside of Lakeland. They're trying to go through the school to get the parents to attend the, what is it called? Where they're bringing them in and, show, and showboating the academies oh, that's the being held at mm -hmm. the expo. expo. And it's being held mm -hmm. at Pathways, the uh, Sun yeah. and Fine. So, so, so through that yeah. and their website and Facebook, social media, they're trying to get the word out. But as a parent, if, if you don't have a computer, how do you know if that note doesn't come home? Right. So right. there's a disconnect there. And, Absolutely. And, and one so, of the the I, thing that really quick if you okay. don't mind one of the things that we, we did talk about and Dion Sanders has a, a great quote and I think we need to get this out to our young people if you if you dress good you feel good if you feel good you play good if you play good they pay good we need to dress the part we need to dress the part when we show up for those interviews and those opportunities because people judge us based on our attire and what we're wearing so that's yeah. critically important as absolutely. well absolutely I think the parents here though are at the a little bit younger age. They're concerned with high school right. and, and middle school. So before they get to the interviews, they need the information so that they can be prepared. But let's, let's bring it back to the community. What, what can the community do to build up better representation in politics? I have a question. Have a question. Oh. Oh, I'm sorry. Go right ahead. So then let me ask this. What type of activities can the youth participate in specific Oh, did you want to answer the original question? Or you want? question. Okay, the youth question. Mm -hmm. Fantastic. You what know, are some activities the youth can participate in to be involved in the political process? I, I think that our community is so blessed to be diverse, mm -hmm. but I think that our community as a whole would be so much uh, benefited by a higher percentage of African American participation in our organizations, our, our government uh, organizations. I think about law enforcement. Uh, my goodness, wouldn't it be so much nicer if we had uh, more diversity in law enforcement? And I think that starts from our youth. I think it starts from the youth possibly thinking that one day they'd like to have a career in law enforcement. Mm -hmm. And it's, it's, that starts at a young age and working towards that. Uh, as a prosecutor, um, you know, I have to travel around the state to bring prosecutors back here to work in our county. Wouldn't it be great if some of the young people here today uh, could someday serve as a prosecutor. There's no reason why they can't. And those, those people someday can be ju <clears throat> judges. Think about this. A few years ago, we lost a fantastic judge, uh, Judge Carla Foreman Wright. She also uh, was our only African-American circuit judge. Uh, judge Kuhn also retired recently. Right. We have on the end. One of the basic definitions of politics is power and motion. It's using power and influence to get resources. In order to use that power and to generate power, you have economic strength. So what a lot of times African American communities are dealing with is a lack of economic strength. And with a lack of economic strength, you're unable to politicize your goals, what you want to realize. So getting the youth involved is teaching them that as they rise and as they educate themselves more, instead of having a community brain drain, if you will, where African American youth that are intelligent and that are making are taken out of the community and serving visions that are not have nothing to do with their community, teaching them to come back. Anyone else on the panel that wanted to answer that? You know, one of the things that I wanted to do when I first ran was to engage the community. Mm -hmm. um, because I am, as I heard over here, that you know, or, or 
Sam had said that, you know, I'm an elected official. I wake every morning up and have 34,000 plus bosses. So it's, you know, I've done everything from the county that has had teach-ins where we go out and speak to the youth and try to get them engaged. We've had uh, youth uh, council people come and basically shadow us. Um, you know, I've actually contacted several schools and did essays to get kids in and, and only turned out two. So, you know, I would pose a question to the audience, you know, how do I get you to, to contact so I can get engaged? Being a local representative, since I serve everybody in this room, I'm as close as you're going to get. So we have to eliminate, again, the barriers for the parents in order to get the children to, to the activities that you're recommending or even the things that you're suggesting. Just an observation. Can anyone and let speak me just to say, transportation? We did have an initiative on the ballot in November and it failed. It failed big time, over 78 percent, I believe, initiative specifically? for a uh, half cent sales tax to go for transit so that we would have a better bus system in the community. And we put it towards a vote and, and it failed. And um, I don't know why uh, we need transportation so, so desperately. Let we me ask, just hold on. How many people by show of hands in the room knew about the initiative that was on the ballot? <coughs> not everybody. That's probably not the majority. And, so, and we had is a, it coming up again or is there anything that can be done about it's, it? It's been on there twice and now I don't believe it will come back again for a while. But we had a marketing right. you uh, guys plan. Right. We, we tried to get it out into the community. Go vote. Vote yes if you want transit everybody. in this community. Let me give just a second. Very quickly because we have a lot of people that want us to speak okay. on it. I don't, I don't think um, transportation is really a problem. Um, this summer they, they had something with the city of Lakeland and also Winter Haven where youth could catch the bus for free, free. to jobs, summer programs, etc. When it's time for, for them to strap up that chin strap and go out to the football games and for football practice, they're there faithfully and religiously. So that once again, we have to continue to encourage education. I'm a product of a program called Upward Bound. I also do after school programs and enrichment programs and exposure is everything. But people got to be willing to sacrifice their time because what I, why I do it, you know, is because I remember living in the projects is hot, roaches doing backflips off the countertop, rats nibbling through the walls, etc. So I say, hey, I'm going to sacrifice my time daily to go out and help make a difference for these kids. Everybody's chasing money. Everybody want to make money, but not many people want to make a difference. So that's why I go out every day. I'm at Bill Duncan. People say, okay. out there with them bad kids. I say, I'm the baddest thing out there. Okay. The gentleman on the end here who's been so kind and patient. The bus issue that we are trying to get an understanding of is not because we didn't want to get on the bus. There are people that can't vote, that do not have a voting right. And those are the people that are riding the bus. Those are the people that's trying to get to the different jobs, trying to get to schools. They can't get on the bus, so they didn't vote for the initiative because they don't have voting rights. We're working on that. I just want to let this audience know as it relates to the recruitment and the state attorney's office is the most powerful law enforcement agency we have uh, here in Polk County and in our judicial circuit. Regrettably to say to you, Mr. Hartz, we don't have any black prosecutors. I've been on this circuit a long time, being the first black prosecutor since 1975. And it is so dismal that we do not have black prosecutors. Black prosecutors, not black prosecutors, but prosecutors ascend to judgeship. That is the tradition of Polk County. I would beg upon you, Mr. Hans, since you probably would be uh, ascending to the office after Mr. Jerry Hill has announce his retirement. <laughs> what is you going to do? Are you going to say, uh, stay in the same attitude and protege of not having black prosecutors? This, this is, we probably the worst county in all of America that does not have representation in the highest office of law enforcement. Our black kids in Polk County uh, send it to prison rather than the schools. We need to address that from law enforcement now very seriously. Thank you. Okay, I think that was directed at you. Would you like to respond? <laughs> <laughs>
That was directed that at was, me. Yeah, yes. that seemed very specific. Um, <laughs> Absolutely. Okay. Mr. Glover, I appreciate your question. And um, actually, we, we do have, um, in the past year, we've had two African American prosecutors. We currently have one. That's far too few. And we need more, and there's no doubt about it. But let me share with you uh, an example of the struggles that it's been to, to hire African American prosecutors. I personally am the, the guy from the office that goes around to the various law schools. And a couple of years ago, that became my job. And it was very apparent to me that it would benefit our office if there were more African American prosecutors. It's, it's a no-brainer. So when I would go on these recruiting trips, I would, I would be on, on the lookout for someone that would be interested in coming to work here uh, at our office. And we extended quite a few uh, letters and, and invitations to come down and job offers. But you know what? They end up going to where they were from, or Orlando, or Tampa, or Tallahassee, or other states. So my comments earlier were, we need to find some homegrown prosecutors uh, from the African American community that will realistically want to live in Polk County and start their careers and be the judges of the next generation. So I take your comments very seriously and it is very important to me. Okay, so off of that, I have two questions and then we'll go back to the audience. One for the police chief. What are ways if the audience or members of the community have suggestions that they'd like to bring to the police officers on ways to interact, how can they do that? Where can they come to bring their suggestions and ideas? I would love to say the officer driving down the street. Yeah, but we know that's not but, but let, Yeah, let's be honest. <laughs> that's not, <laughs> that's not going to happen. What can they but do? But I, I can guarantee you that all the administrators and the leadership in Polk County, the police leadership, uh -huh. uh, actively want that kind of input. So is there an email that you can share with us somewhere? Is, or is there someone specifically that you can say email this person? I would say email the chief of police of whatever agency that you're interested in. Go straight to the top. My name is Robert Doyle. Judge I'm a Doyle. retired circuit court judge. Where are the white people? I mean, basically, I mean, as I'm sorry if you knew anything about me as a judge, you know I say what I think, and that's the problem. I mean, we're talking to people here who already know what's going on, and we need white people here, first of all. Second, I disagree with the chief. If you want to get somebody's attention, don't send them an email. Go knock on their door. Okay. 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 Yeah. That's all it. Right. So you're going to have people knocking on your door. There it is. <laughs> all right, I have a question here in the front. Appreciate that. We have a question here in the audience, and then I'll go to the right. What can we do about making sure that we educate our police force about the history? Because, you know, history is a very important part of it. Um, you know, what can we do about educating them about the history, not only within this city, but within this country? Let's give them a chance to answer. We need to do the exact same thing that we're doing right here, but with that as the topic. I mean, it's one thing for the, the law enforcement side to say this is how we perceive it, but if we don't get together and communicate and have meetings and discussions and be open, we need cultural awareness, uh, not just for the African American community, but you get uh, Hispanic communities or uh, Asian communities that, you know, just eye contact will set somebody off. And, you know, if the law enforcement community that doesn't understand or realize the different cultures, you know, it, it creates problems right off the bat. We need more African Americans serving in law enforcement. That is a huge, think about it, when you have members who are working together on the force, they, they share their experiences, they share their history. That's how you get to really know somebody when you're working a case with someone. And then the other thing is for our law enforcement officers to get out of the cars and get into the communities. Uh, go to the, the places where athlete, you know, the athletics, the churches, uh, know the people, get to know the people that they serve. And I think that's that's a, a two-pronged approach that could really benefit our community. Are there any yeah. diversity initiatives for hiring mm -hmm. happening? Perfect chance for recruitment. Yes. <laughs> I'll throw it out. To you. The African American is a commodity. Yes. It's it's wide open, especially a female. Man, I, you know I I'd get on my knees and beg you to come join law enforcement. <laughs> it, it, it's it's there. We need you. We need a diverse law enforcement to match a diverse community. We actually we have one you. more person that wants to weigh in on your question. Really quick with respect to law enforcement, one of the things that's under the purview of the city manager is a law enforcement agency. And I can tell you African-American candidates are a commodity. 
we go to graduations and by the time an african-american law enforcement officer accepts mm. their credentials and walks off that stage orlando tampa tallahassee they scoop them up and we can't compare we can't pay what those agencies pay so one of the <clears> things we need to do a better job in is home growing our talent one of the things that we're looking to roll out as an organization is that we will literally pay you five hundred dollars a month as you are going to school to become a law enforcement officer and then after you're done you get a guaranteed job all you have to do is work for us for two years I want to answer. Let me jump in okay. real quick. Uh, okay, we're gonna have two, to keep two, it quick, two though, because you guys two get seconds. a little long-winded on this. We side. have a law enforcement academy right here at Post State College, and if you're interested in going through our program, I got my card tonight. I can give it to you. You can call me. So if you're interested in going to law enforcement, okay, uh, I have the card tonight. Thank you. That was great. One of the questions you asked was how do how do the law enforcement go out and understand what goes on in the community with the broken families? What we've done in Winter Haven is we actually have two individuals from the NAACP that sit on, <coughs> excuse me, the boards when they're hired. From the time that they're hired, they ask them the questions, and they also serve on the promotional boards. So those individuals actually sit on the boards through those processes, and they're there to ask those particular questions during that process. So before we leave, I'd like to give everyone an opportunity to state their contact information, how people can get in touch with each of these individuals so if there's something that a question that you'd like to direct to them you can follow up on your own. Thank you so much to our panelists um, and to our moderator uh, Mitzi Miller I want to I want to thank you for taking time out of your busy schedules to come and share with us today now I am going to ask the person that always Lucille said everything I was going to say, so I'll be quick. But I have two things that I'll need to do. The first is, of course, let me thank the panel as well. You all did a phenomenal job on Courageous Conversation. Thank you so much. And thank you to the community as well for attending and sharing. We really appreciate your doing that. But at this time, I'd like to ask Mitzi to please come forward. We have a token of appreciation for you. Because when you come to Polk State College, we, you always leave with something that you will keep forever. And when you look at it and you think about it, you will indeed think of Polk State College. So we just recently shared, we're coming to the end of sharing our 50th anniversary. So we're proud of that. So we have our bags and all of that. So you have a lot of goodies inside here. And each time you look at those items, we hope that you will think of us and you will use them. And we have truly enjoyed your coming here to share with us. And we know that you are enjoying the Florida weather. We'll look chilly here but not as chilly as they are in Chicago am I accurate you are very accurate. all right thank and you so much thank you mm. and I just want to I just want to quickly say the panel says you guys were awesome really and truly these conversations are never easy everyone has an opinion everyone always has a solution that they think couldn't be a quick fix so I really applaud everybody sitting up here for doing the work you get up every day and you do what you can and coming out to have that conversation will hopefully motivate others to join you in that so thank you to the panelists thank you. Thank you. and then just a few words that I'd like for you to